If you ask action fans to list their favorite movies, almost everyone will probably mention Die Hard. Bruce Willis, or rather his character John McClane in his iconic white jersey, became a national hero and changed the audience's perception of action heroes. However, the franchise began to gradually lose its charm by the third film. How does the first Die Hard differ from its sequels? How does he break the cliché of classic action movies? And what important themes does this film cover? It's about movies, and today we're going to take a look at what made Die Hard a cult film. Get comfortable, and let's get started. Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. Of course, the main trump card of Die Hard is the main character performed by Bruce Willis. He is the actor who by that time was known for the comedy series Moonlighting. New York cop John McClane is nothing like the classic action heroes, romantic fighters against evil, the deadpan cowboys from westerns, or the invulnerable killing machines that they were in the cult action films of the 80s. Moreover, this dissimilarity of John McClane is directly stated in the film. Just another American who saw too many movies as a child. John McClane, along with depressed cop Martin Riggs from Lethal Weapon, broke the cliché of action films and added the unique charm of Bruce Willis to the genre canon. His appearance was more suitable for everyday comedy. A noticeable bald spot on his head, a stretched t-shirt, and finally a completely comical detail that the hero has carried out almost all the action barefoot. His jokes, not like short phrases of Schwarzenegger, reflect superiority over the enemy. You're a funny guy, Sally. I like you. That's why I'm going to kill you last. The black humor of John McClane is the nervous reaction of an ordinary person to an extraordinary situation. Attention, whoever you are, this channel is reserved for emergency calls only. The f shit, lady! Do I sound like I'm ordering a pizza? But the main thing was that before we knew little about heroes of action films, about their personal lives, problems, and anxieties, and we knew almost everything about John McClane. After all, the first 20 minutes of the film are devoted to a detailed exposition, first of his relationship with his wife. He is able to love, show care, and is attached to his children, whom he is comically carrying a huge soft toy in a plane. In a word, McLean is a real person whom we empathize with not only during fights. This is not an ideal character. He is good at work, but bad in his personal life. He changes dramatically over the time of the first film. See him, he had a ray gun look real enough. At the beginning of the film, we see how the married hero first exchanges a glance with a flight attendant, then looks back at the girl at the airport and is distracted by a half-naked woman in a neighboring building after the terrorist attack. John McClane is stung that his wife does not use his last name and that she is focused on her career. He rethinks his life, having got into an almost hopeless situation in the course of the film. The when things started to pan out for her, I should have been more supportive. And uh... We hear how he introduces his wife by her maiden name, recognizing her desires and dreams at the end of the film. How is my wife, Holly? Holly Gennaro. Holly McClane. At the same time, the original Die Hard can be called a conservative manifesto, a representative for the mood of the USA in the 80s in some way. A simple but kind man, with the help of violence, saves a helpless careerist wife and returns her to the family. No wonder John McClane accomplishes his feat on Christmas, the main American family holiday. White sheets of paper fall from the sky at the end instead of traditional snow, which does not happen in California. Willis portrayed that image of an ordinary Superman in other films, from Pulp Fiction to The Fifth Element. The role of a charismatic man reluctantly fighting evil and overcoming a hangover is loved by viewers everywhere. The first Die Hard spawned a wave of copycat films in the 90s that pitted ordinary heroes against villains in confined spaces. And in general, he influenced the tone of the action film genre. However, in the franchise itself, the image of the hero turned out to be impossible to save. Although McLean at first tries to not intervene in a dangerous situation in the two sequels, over the years, Willis also acquired its usual grandeur and he no longer looks so organically in the role of an accidental savior of the situation. And the mild irony towards McLean sometimes turned into a rude mockery. Oh God. Oh my God. And librarian that I had a bad headache, but she didn't believe me. I really do have a bad headache, though. The creators tried to return to the theme of family values in the fourth part, which was the main one in the original film. 
but that personal motivation appeared in the hero only closer to the finale when the villain kidnapped McLean's grown daughter. Bruce Willis goes to Moscow to save his son in the last part, but the already stereotyped plot is spoiled by lengthy monologues and the lack of chemistry between on-screen relatives. His image is finally losing its former sincerity and moral guidelines, despite the fact that McLean is still trying to joke. What is worth only the chase scene in which the good cop John McLean literally rides over the heads of innocent people? And most importantly, in the fifth part, he too obviously knows how to save the world and readily rushes into battle, which immediately loses half the charm of the hero, who in the original film constantly grumbled about his position. Nine million terrorists in the world and I gotta kill one with feet smaller than my sister. The unusual person in Die Hard was not only the main character, but also his antagonist, as down-to-earth and understandable as McLean himself. It was the first role in the movie for the British theater actor Alan Rickman. He approached the image of the German terrorist Hans Gruber with the same theatrical thoroughness and detail. Rickman was able to create the image of an adventurer, an inventive and bloodthirsty rogue, retaining the general demonism in which actions there is not a shadow of fantasism, only cold calculation and passion for the game. After all your posturing, all your little speeches, you're nothing but a common thief. I am an exceptional thief, Mrs. McLean, and since I'm moving up to kidnapping, you should be more polite. In addition, a very colorful henchman strongman balancing an intelligent Briton was found for him in the first Die Hard. The Soviet ballet immigrant dancer Alexander Gudinov played that role. The image of Hans Gruber is deliberately built in contrast to the main character. The strictly elegant suit stood against a plaid shirt and the iconic white t-shirt. Alan Rickman's performance is as restrained and serious as possible, while Bruce Willis's speech is full of witty remarks. I know what a TV dinner feels like. At the same time, the two opponents are related by charisma and the ability to improvise. Hi there. How you doing? The musical theme of Hans Gruber was Beethoven's Ode to Joy. On the one hand, this immediately marks the German terrorists as strangers, messengers of a different culture. On an audio level, this pits the villain against the real American John McClane. The Christmas song, Let It Snow, sounds in the finale for a reason. Let it snow, let it snow. On the other hand, Ode to Joy has many cultural connotations. It is worth recalling its use in Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange with its critique of ultraviolence. From there, the melody from Singing in the Rain was also given to Die Hard, which was sung in one of the scenes by a burglar. That musical intertextuality in itself took the film to a new level, added new shades to the complex, rich story, and made the image of Hans Gruber unforgettable. In the future, it was not possible to create the same complex and thoughtful antagonists. In the second part, the caricature drug lord with orders has already acted as a villain. In the third Die Hard, there was an attempt to repeat the image of Rickman. Jeremy Irons was invited to play the role of Hans Gruber's younger brother. But the delicate and aristocratic Briton played only the shadow of Gruber, a timid attempt to repeat what Rickman did on the screen. The natural charisma of Irons still easily outperformed the discreet Timothy Oliphant and Sebastian Koch, who in the last two parts for some reason came up with large-scale villainous plans contrary to the spirit of the franchise, whether it be cybersecurity spy games or the theft of weapons of mass destruction. The increase in scale of what is happening is generally characteristic of action franchises. But in the case of the story of John McClane, it rather played against the sequels. One of the features of the first Die Hard is that it's practically a radio play. Bruce Willis communicates with Alan Rickman on the walkie-talkie for half the film and interacts in the same way with sudden allies, police officer Powell. It is noteworthy that for the first time, McClane meets him face-to-face -face only in the last scene, decided almost like a rom-com finale. It is in conversations with Sergeant Powell that McClane reveals the details of his life confesses and demonstrates the psychological depth to the fullest. Tell her that, um, that she is the best thing that ever happened to a bum like me. 
These heart-to-heart -heart conversations are more valuable because Bruce Willis generally spends most of his time in solitude, and all his remarks and jokes addressed to himself are actually addressed to us, the audience, whose attention is completely focused on the main character. And it seems that it is this character trait, his constant isolation from others, that makes John McClane so special. Thank God damn it, thank. In the second part, this alignment is preserved and Bruce Willis is mostly alone and runs around the airport. But then he gets partners, ranging from charming Samuel L. Jackson, the acting duo with whom is definitely on the list of best buddy movies, to the boring Jai Courtney with the role of his son. No gold on this boat. You know that. This transition to collaboration led to John McClane being a guest of his own franchise in the last two parts. And in terms of plot, he acted more as a sidekick, a partner of a young hero, than a full-fledged character with his own story. The innovation of Die Hard was not only in the dramaturgy itself and the personality of the characters, but also in the conditions that dramaturgy created on the screen. Contrary to the myth that an action film should be large-scale, the action of the first part is almost a spectacle that takes place in real time in a single building. Events here develop literally in a couple of locations. There is the hall where the party is taking place, the technical floor of the skyscraper, and the space between these rooms. And a rare crawl on the roof. Thanks to that unity of time and places, director John McTiernan managed to create a real score of the camera and characters' movements in space, which constantly keeps the viewer in suspense. We never know who McLean will meet around the corner and where he will be able to hide once again. Glass walls and transparency of the boundaries inside the building only create additional depth of action and add dynamics to it. The editing of Die Hard is uncharacteristically slow for an action movie. There are quite a few long shots here. It was more important for John McTiernan not to create chaotic dynamics within the shot, but to give the viewer an understanding of where the characters are so that the action does not turn into a trembling mess. There is a lot of handheld shooting in the film. The camera is in constant motion and constantly accompanies the characters. Such a formal decision makes you put yourself in John McClane's shoes. Worry about him, feel the confusion of the character, and the need to improvise. Oh, John, what the fuck are you doing? How the fuck did you get into this shit? In-frame editing allowed to gradually discover new details that increase tension. Both the deep mise-en-scene and the gradual up-the-ante for John McClane, who is constantly lacking the resources to fight opponents, work for suspense. McTiernan makes precise use of avant-garde techniques for individual scenes. There is Dutch Corner, reflecting a nervous fragment of the conversation between the protagonist and the antagonist, rapid in the culmination moment, or energetic zooming, backlighting, and new wave editing when Hans Gruber reveals the identity of McClane's wife. This is McLean. How nice to make your acquaintance. The space with sparks from wires and flashing red lights adds tension to the final scene, preserving that unity of time and place so that the location itself becomes one of the characters was not so easy in subsequent films. The second Die Hard managed to fit in the much more complex and almost limitless space of the airport. In the rest of the sequels, that rule had to retreat. McLean actively travels in space and even performs complex stunts in cars and trucks. In the sequels, the action has ceased to be realistic and tactile. And John McLean has finally turned into a superhero who does not care about any explosions and chases. Look at you. I'm not a doctor, but you, but you look like you're hurt. Yeah. Sexy, right? No. Come on. We don't need a doctor, we need the cops. This image contrasts strongly with the way we first met and fell in love with that lonely, wounded, unfortunate mortal hero. But first, he was alive and real. It would be surprising if at least one Die Hard sequel could repeat the success and innovation of the original film. There were too many bold experiments and paradoxical moves in it. And the golden age of action movies has passed, and the genre has turned into a purely niche and nostalgia. Despite this, only a fifth of the franchise can be considered an absolute failure. The second part had unexpected plot twists and ingeniously used airport settings. 
In the third part, director John McTiernan masterfully created the action scenes with puzzle solving and kept the atmosphere tense throughout the film. And the fourth Die Hard interestingly introduced the analog character into the modern digital world. Ultimately, the image of John McClane will forever remain in the history of the action genre as visible proof that a spectacular film can be smart. And an action hero can suffer, cry, express his feelings, and in general, be a living person. Probably many franchises sooner or later lose the charm of the first parts. Die Hard is far from the worst one. For example, the fourth and fifth films of the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise turned out to be frankly bad and lost the spirit of the first films. If you click on this icon on your screen, you will find out why the franchise began to lose quality, who is responsible for that, and what made the first three pirate films so popular. Follow the link and watch. About Movies was with you today. Like this video and see you soon. Bye-bye.